lean into today's message, uh, I want to lighten it a little bit and, and introduce to you um, a car that you might have driven um, and a car that I think everyone, I'm making an assumption, everyone has driven this car at some point in their life, um, an antique car at an amusement park. Uh, it was at a time in your life where you didn't have your license yet. You were you were young and little, and you just had this immense freedom when you got to drive this car. You buckled in. You were in the front, not in the back or in a car seat anymore. You got to be in the front, and you relegated your mom or your dad, especially your sibling. You kicked them in the back because you were going to drive. And you were just going to have a blast. And so you buckled in, you mashed the gas pedal, and you went a blistering five miles an hour on this first road trip you've ever taken. And as you're driving, you notice there's a path in front of the car, and you do your best to follow the path. It curves to the left, and you turn the wheel to the left. It curves to the right, and you turn the wheel a little bit to the right. And you're doing great. You feel like a Formula One race car driver on this path. It's just awesome. And you're just so excited. And then in the middle of driving the car, something happens, and you hear a bam. You're like, where did that come from? And the steering wheel's jerked out of your hands, and you're like, what, what is going on? And so you get the steering wheel right, you get back on the path, and it goes off to a different direction, and bam, it happens again. And the steering wheel seems like it has a mind of its own. And you're looking at this like, what am I doing wrong? I'm, I'm driving well. And you're looking around, and finally you figure it out. You see ahead of the car, in the middle of the path, you see that there's this metal track right down the middle. And no matter what you do, this car is going to follow that metal track. And you try to fight it, you buck against it, and it turns to the left, and the car's going left. You want it to go right, you want to go off-roading, it's not going to let you do that. And finally, you just give up and resign yourself to say, well, why should I even drive? What's the purpose anymore? The car's going to go where it's going to go. That metal track, I can't fight against it. The only fun you can have now at this point is to mash the gas pedal and go fast enough to hit the car ahead of you. And that's about the only fun you can create out of this whole experience. But you were so deflated. You were so sad because you thought you had it under control. You thought you were on this adventure only to have this bam happen and realize there's a pattern, there's a track, there's something predetermined already that's there that you are trying to fight against and you're just not winning. I want to use that metaphor. I want to use that image as this journey uh, of our mental and emotional well-being. Because there are thoughts, there are phrases, there are soundtracks that we have that we say to ourselves over and over and over again. We have a soundtrack for our career, for our family, for our neighbors, for people around us, for ourselves. And if these soundtracks, if these loops that we play in our minds, if they're good and they're healthy, they lead to creativity and hope, and you can see Jesus in anything. But if these soundtracks are broken, if they're awful and bad, they're going to stifle the work of the Spirit inside of you. They're going to push you down. They're going to hold you back because of the way you're thinking. And if these paths continue to be broken, it can lead to some pretty bad places. Some of the common thoughts that people have are the fears that haunt us. A few weeks ago when Pastor Popovitz talked about the what-ifs, it's those what-ifs that we constantly replay in our heads, that loop that holds us back. It's the regret that says, my last job was so much better than this one, and you are filled with regret, wishing you could turn back time and go back to the way it was. Or there's the loop of blame, where you say, everything's my fault, I'm such an awful person, I can't believe this is my fault again. Or resignation, where you just say, this is how things are going to be. Nothing's ever going to change, and it's going to be like this forever. And you play that loop over and over and over again. Or you say to yourself, I'm not enough, or I'm too stupid for this, or this is just impossible. This, this will, I'll never be able to overcome this. All of those soundtracks, all of those loops, they play in our minds whether we realize it or not. And when we can realize it, we can do something about that because those loops affect the results we see in life. They affect God's work in and through us. Not only that, is it hard to bring those loops out in the forefront and realize, oh yeah, I'm thinking about dread right now or I'm thinking about how I'm not good enough anymore. What we do is then we just confirm that And we look at everything around us and it confirms the loop that we have in our mind. So for example, if you think you're the most unorganized person in the world, 
you think that, even though you planned a meal uh, for the whole week, you went grocery shopping ahead of time, you planned a party that weekend, you got everything all set. So you organized all that, but the moment you're late three minutes to a meeting, that loop comes back and says, yep, you're not good enough, you don't measure up, and you're the most unorganized person ever. Those thoughts, those loops affect our emotional well-being. And God gives us hope to deal with those thoughts. Look with me in Romans chapter 12. In verse 2, he says this. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't conform to those soundtracks. Don't conform to those loops that you're playing over and over and over in your mind that are broken, that are unhealthy. But be transformed. So what does that look like? Be transformed by the renewing of your what? Renewing of your mind. He says, our mind and our thoughts are so important. Transform, renew your mind, and think new thoughts. Think new soundtracks, new loops in your mind. Then you'll be able to attest and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So God is showing us in his word that the thoughts we think about ourselves, the thoughts we think about others, are so very important to be aware of so that we can deal with those and test them and see if they're true and if they're healthy and good to keep saying those things. But if they're broken and unhealthy, to get rid of them and have new thoughts come in. Sometimes we can do this work uh, by having a family member speak into us and speak truth to us. Uh, sometimes it's a friend who says, why are you thinking that way? You're so much better than that. Jesus is doing so much more work in you than you can ever imagine. Sometimes it takes those people in our lives that we listen to to say, yeah, you're right. That's a broken soundtrack. I need to adjust that. Sometimes we need professionals. Sometimes we need more help than what just our family and friends can give us. And that's what's part of this series is all about. Because experts tell us that one in five adults wrestle with mental illness and that children, that mental illness, 50% of all chronic cases start when they're 14 years old. And because of the stigma and because of all the barriers, they wait about 10 or 15 years before they even begin to deal with those issues. And at Glory Day, we want to close that gap. In the state of Texas, uh, there are experts who say in Texas, we are third in need when you compare that to the rest of the nation. So our need in Texas is third in a, across the nation, but yet 50th in services and access to address that need. And when I came across that, there was this holy discontent to say, we have got to close the gap on that. We need to help people address those issues, and we need to provide services so that there are more access to those services so people can address those issues. So what would it look like, Gloria Day, if you dream with me? What would it look like if we could tackle those issues in the name of Jesus? What if we could help people see Jesus' redemptive work in their lives in the midst of their thoughts and their feelings as they journey through life? What if we could bring Jesus to these problems and these issues and these struggles so that other people can help others through those same issues? What if you could have a trusted resource that you could point your family members to or your community or your neighbors that you can say, you know what, I, I, I see that you're struggling. This is a great resource. They will definitely give you the hope and help you work these things out. What if there was a way that we could validate someone's mental health journey and, and have them reach a point just like Patricia and Michael Kemmer to be able to see how God is using that to walk alongside others and children and adults? Well, for the past four years, ever since I've been here at Gloria Day, I've been working on a solution to that. I've been trying to figure out what that looks like for us as a church community. It all started when Pastor Dan and Beth Kerber, Beth Kerber, our chief of staff and operations, they cast this need and this vision to say, uh, Randy, we know you, we've got this history that you've had in the past. What can we do at Gloria Day to address these issues? And so I was praying over that, thinking through that, like, what would that look like for us? And on a Sunday morning uh, in the common area after church, someone came up to me as we were greeting everyone, and they came up to me and they said, Randy. And I said, Richard. Richard was the Episcopal priest in a town in Tennessee that I served before moving here to Gloria Day. See, I was a Lutheran pastor in that town, and we had a, a faith-based counseling agency, and it was a partnership of five or six other churches. And Richard was the Episcopal priest uh, as one of those partner churches. Well, I accepted a position later on to a church in Michigan. He retired from being a priest and moved back here to the Clear Lake area. 
and his family found a home here at Gloria Day before I even arrived. And so when I arrived here, he said, this Randy Miller, there can only be one. And I'm like, okay, good. That's a good reputation to have. Good. I'm glad that friendship lasted. But Richard and I picked up this work and we said, what might that look like? What would it look like for us to begin this journey? And that's what led us to the Community Needs Survey. Many of you participated in that. You remember that survey that we put out a few years ago. And we got some really great feedback. We were able to get some qualitative and quantitative data. So it was pre-COVID when that launched and it ended post-COVID. And we have some really great stories through that. But all through that survey, what that told us is, Gloria Day, you appreciate and you affirm the ministries here that help people along on this journey. And you also recognize, Gloria Day, you told us in that survey that there's more work to be done and that you would be supportive of that work. And so that gave us permission to forge ahead and continue looking at what the possibilities might look like. Through a series of conversations, as Richard and I explored this, we were introduced to Dr. Mark Mayfield. Uh, Dr. Mayfield is professional experience in treating and addressing anxiety and depression, PTSD, self-injury, and he's passionate about integrating faith with mental health. And he's on the forefront of brain science and attachment therapies, and he's dedicated his whole life to take our faith in Christ and help people confront their fears and confront their feelings of being isolated and alone. And so as I got to meet uh, Mark and, and Dr. Mayfield and got to talk to him a little bit, I said, you know, Mark, this is great. You're doing great work in Colorado. Uh, I, that's wonderful. It's a great partnership. But what does that mean for us? You're in Colorado. I'm in Texas. And he said, well, Randy, to tell you the truth, God's been leading our family to move to North Houston next year. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm not going to ignore that. We need to pursue that. And uh, so they've moved here into Houston. And throughout this year, Mark has led workshops and trainings uh, to build momentum and to see the interest that there is in a nonprofit. And through all of that, we see that there definitely is interest and support to start a nonprofit. So over uh, May and over the summer, we built a design team to help flesh out what that looks like and what that means. And here's a picture of the design team. You see me, and there's Richard Zalazak, Beth Kerber, Chief of Staff and Operations, and Dawn Peterson, who's a member here at Gloria Day and is a certified life coach for a national agency helping employees and employers have better mental health in their uh, professional environments. And, and so as we begin to design this new venture and figure out what that exactly looks like here in our community, we arrived uh, and used the methods and the philosophies of the 5-2 network. Some of you might remember the partnership we have with 5-2. 5-2 is a network that activates Christians leaders to launch new ventures that impact communities. And oftentimes these new ventures go to underserved and under-resourced populations. In 5.2, since 2015, we have successfully launched 111 new ventures and introduced 99,505 people to Jesus. And these ventures are a wide range of adventures, from food pantries to neonatal uh, clinics, uh, all sorts of ventures, soon to be added a counseling ministry and a wellness center that serves this area. And so it was clear as we looked at the philosophies and methods and principles of 5-2, as we looked at God's vision that he's placed in our heart, it was very clear that he was calling us to launch a nonprofit. And this nonprofit would be an expression of Gloria Day, our vision to help more people live life with Jesus every day, and as a direct response to Jesus' call to help people who are broken by life circumstances. And so this is going to be an independent 501c3 organization that's going to launch out of Gloria Day. And this nonprofit will champion and empower mental wellness and emotional well-being in the Bay Area. And so common questions that people have when they hear this is, well, what's it called? What's the name of this nonprofit? And after Googling, all the obvious names were taken. And so we landed on this name, Nova Vita. And I learned many of you know Latin, so this is great. For those of you who don't know Latin, that means new life. Nova Vita, new life, that this nonprofit exists to empower mental and emotional well-being for individuals, for families, for couples, for anyone that needs help walking through this journey. We want to take the stigma out of this conversation and say that there's no shame or no judgment in reaching out for help. 
that it's okay to love Jesus and seek a counselor. It's okay to love Jesus and trust in him with all your life and have a therapist with you too. That it's okay to love Jesus and see a psychiatrist. That it's okay to love Jesus and have a faith in him and see a psychologist. That it's okay to have a faith in Jesus and walk with him and have it be a medicated journey under the, a licensed professional. That it's okay to have these struggles, to say, you know what, I love Jesus and I love what he's done in my life, but I'm not okay, I need help. And this isn't just for people who follow Christ. This isn't just for people who are members of Gloria Day. Nova Vita and this nonprofit wants to speak courage into the teenager who struggles so much with their self-image, to create more safe places for people to explore what it means to have a healthy emotional well-being, to show that there's hope for a person who struggles with their day-to-day -day life, to see someone who's stuck in their family system, to break out of that and have a new experience in Jesus Christ. And through it all, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through those conversations, to be able to have someone see that there's hope and that not all is lost. And so we want to seek partnerships with area churches and businesses and be able to have this separate nonprofit entity be vibrant and successful. And we know it will be. And there are common questions that people, as I've shared this, that they've had, so I want to answer and address those questions. Who's going to staff it? Well, there's going to be licensed professional counselors, people who are licensed and are a professional in this area and the area of counseling and have a certified uh, supervisor over all of that. And I would ask for your prayers about that because once we uh, bring on the clinical supervisor, then we're out of the gates and watch out. There, it, it'll just be on the road. Um, and in addition to that, having licensed professional counselors, having interns serve, uh, be able to get their hours as well and speak into them and be able to launch them out into our community to be hopeful. And also have our counselors of a variety of backgrounds so they can address the variety of backgrounds and nationalities that are represented in our congregation and in our community. Uh, one question I've had someone ask me is, does that mean, Pastor Randy, you're going to be on staff over there? And I said, no, I want you to dispel that rumor. I don't have the skills or the tools or the desire to do that. I love being a pastor at Glory Day. I love serving you. And I love that this nonprofit is happening so that it's another community partner um, launched out of Glory Day to address these needs in our area. Another question I've had is, where's the money going to come from for this? And that's a loop I always... Um, I rejected that loop, that scarcity mindset of where's the money going to come from. I've always believed that where there's vision and a team and a model, that God will provide the resources to move forward. And that certainly has been the case here. Because of your courageous generosity and because of your sacrificial giving, we're able to start this up and launch this this month. Because you've given, whether it's to the MMF fund or to benevolence or to missions, because of our benevolence and missions giving, a portion of that is going to this effort. The endowment fund committee supports this effort and has provided funds for that as well. And a private individual anonymously gave $25,000 to get this going. So because of all of that, we're able to get started, form those partnerships, and begin addressing those needs in the name of Jesus in our area. And this is so much bigger than just a counseling center. We see this as a, a wellness resource where there's a virtual library that people can access 24-7 and receive the skills and the tools that they need for the struggles that they have. We see workshops and trainings for businesses and schools in our area. We also see that there would be a fund to help offset the cost for those who can't afford counseling but truly need it. Back in my Tennessee days uh, with Richard and the other pastors in that area, there was someone who just made a transformation in their life. But one day they showed up to the counselor and all they had was um, cookies that they baked. That was the best they could offer. And we honored that and we said, you're doing so great. Keep it up. We're cheering you on. And all the other partnerships made up the difference. And where will this launch? Initially, it'll launch out of Gloria Day, but we see the vision to have satellite sites all through the Bay Area, from Pasadena all the way to Galveston, so that it's easy for people to receive the services and the hope that they need in order to drive and find a counselor and be able to get those services. And so what can you do? Hearing all this, hearing the excitement and the passion that we're a church that just doesn't talk about it, that just doesn't look at the scripture, but also does something about it to impact the community and change the conversation.
There are a number of things that you can do. And so as I describe them, I want to invite the band forward. And the first thing you can do is, is to work on your own mental well-being. And there's a scripture passage that I would encourage you to put in front of you all the time. Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians 4 gives us a litmus, gives us whenever we have these loops in our mind, these soundtracks that pull us off course, gives us something objective to say, how do we deal with that soundtrack? And the scripture goes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything is commendable and excellent, worthy of praise, and look what God's word says, think, think about such things. And take that laundry list, take that list and say, is that true? Is that honorable? Is that excellent? Is that thought I'm thinking, is that praiseworthy? In our household, we simplify this list. We say, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it kind? So as you think about your thoughts and you think about the things you think about yourself or think about others, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it kind? And if it's not, Go back to scripture, go in prayer and ask God to remove those thoughts. And like Romans 12, 2 says, give you new thoughts, transform your mind. At the end of the service, the ushers are going to be handing out a card. This is a mental wellness card. On the, <clears throat> on the back of this card, there are local community efforts, including Nova Vita, that you can call if you're struggling. If you know someone else who's struggling, you could give that card or give that resource to them. And I would encourage you to use that card as a moment of prayer, to pray about this effort, to pray for those who struggle with these issues. And the last encouragement I would give to you is, is to sit with Jesus, is to sit with him and consider what he does in your life, in the lives of those around you, to change and transform your thinking and your living. There's a story of two sisters who hosted Jesus. Can you imagine hosting Jesus in your home all the prep work, all the preparations you'd have to do so that everything was set for Jesus, your Lord and your Savior. And there's Mary sitting with Jesus, having a conversation. And there's Martha doing everything, serving them, refilling their drinks, getting the appetizers out of the oven, serving those up. And Martha gets ticked off. She gets mad. You can hear the cupboards banging. You could hear just all of that going on. And Martha finally has had it. And she yells out and she says to Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? I'm doing all this work and Mary's doing nothing. See, Martha had a, a loop for Mary. Martha had a soundtrack for Mary that Mary was supposed to be the one to help her do all the chores, do all the dishes with her. And Jesus responds, Martha, Mary has chosen what's better. You are anxious. You are worried about so many things. But what Mary has chosen will not be taken away from her. That story from Luke chapter 10, I want to encourage you with, to sit with Jesus, to take your worries, your anxieties, your fears, whenever you don't measure up, whenever you're frustrated, someone else doesn't measure up, to take them to Jesus, because that will never be taken away from you. He is our hope. He gives us purpose. He gives us meaning. He gives us a future. And he is exactly what our community needs to deal with these issues so that they can live a fully alive life in Jesus Christ, in his name. Amen.